So this uh, winter's retreat I've emphasized this um, we're going to to uh, bring this feeling for right understanding samaditi because it's a, it's an intuitive understanding it's not a conceptual one. I found it very helpful in just, you know, like contemplating the difference between thinking, analytical thinking and intuitive awareness. Just to make it clear uh, you know, what what that is is the difference between the use of the mind to think, analyze, uh, reason, criticize, to hold, to, you know, have ideas, perceptions, views and opinions, to the uh, intuitive awareness, which is non-critical. It includes criticism, it's as an inclusive awareness, so it's not, it's not like criticism is, isn't allowed in it, but it's Criticism is included. So it's, it's criti- the critical mind is seen as an object. Your tendency to criticize or compare, to to hold one view, say this is better than that, or this is right, that's wrong. Uh, criticism of yourself or others or whatever. Even though criticisms can be justified and valid on that level. We're not interested on that uh, in in just developing uh, our critical faculties because they're usually in countries like this highly highly developed already. But to develop to trust in the intuitive awareness. So, like words sati sampachanya come to life and and. Uh, I use satipanya a lot before panya, but then sampatanya is a word that you know say that I translated into English as clear comprehension, which is so vague and kind of you know even though it says clear, <laughs> it, 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 you know, you know, it doesn't give you a sense of it of it of the. Uh, of the broadness of that clarity, you know, you, when you when you have clearly defined, when you have clear definitions of everything, then you feel, you think you have clear comprehension. So that's why we don't like confusion, isn't it? We don't like to feel foggy or confused or or uh, uncertain. These kind of states, we really dislike and you know spend a lot of time trying to have clear comprehension or certainty so so but then sampatanya includes fogginess includes confusion includes uh, uh, uncertainty insecurity so it's a clear comprehension or the apperception of, of confusion is like this. Uncertainty, insecurity is like this. So it's a clear comprehension or apprehension of even uh, the most vague or amorphous or nebulous uh, mental, uh, mental conditions.
So then it's uh, this, you know, like some people, you know, find this approach frustrating because it's easier to be told exactly what to do, you know, to have a more methodic approach. But many of us have done that, and and uh, and even though it has it, it you know, it's it, uh, it's try, can be very skillful. Uh, it also can be we kind of addictive, like we we never get to the root of the cause, which is you know I I am this person that needs. This and and uh, in order to become enlightened, so this uh, intuitive approach doesn't exclude meth- methodical meditations. You know, it's not like I'm against, uh, you know, the 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 methods of meditation or or that 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 uh, exist in in our tradition Theravada Buddhism not at all but even trying to put that into perspective so that if you do you know go to okay, uh, these different uh, um, meditation retreats or courses or whatever then you know you're, you're not you know basic I'm hoping that that what uh, what you've contemplated during this winter is uh, will have some you know help you to be able to do the method in a much more skillful way than if you just start from from just faith in the method and the, and the, and and never questioning, never seeing beyond uh, the uh, ignorant perceptions of yourself. You know, if you start from from the ignorant perceptions of yourself as your basis. You know, so this is this winter retreat has been to encourage uh, you to to really question, to really look in, into these perceptions you have of yourself. You know, be whatever they might be, if you think you're the best, greatest God's gift to the world, or you think you're the absolute bottom of the stack or you, you don't you know who you are what you want or sometimes you think you're superior sometimes you feel inferior whatever because these things change the personality view sakya ditti sila bhata paramatha which he as uh, the first three fetters that Hide the path that keep us from seeing the the uh, way of non-suffering. It's like trying to figure out how to be aware, isn't it? It's, it's an impossible task. You know what is what is he talking about anyway? Wake up, be aware, and, and then trying to figure it out and think about it. You just go around in circles. It's it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating intuitive awareness. is frustrating to an analytical person whose faith is in thought and and reason, logic. So awareness then isn't isn't a matter of you know it's it's right now so it's not a matter of thinking about it but being aware of thinking about it. How do you do that? <laughs> it's like like my my insight came uh, when I was a summoner. How do you stop thinking? And then the stop thinking. Well, how do you Stop. Just stop. How do you just stop? <laughs> the, the the mind would always come back with, you know, how? How can you do it? Wanting to wanting to figure it out rather than trusting in the imminent imminence of it. 
And then trusting is relaxing into into it, and just the attentiveness in which uh, it's an act of faith, it's a trustingness, it's sada. Like with it, then, then it, it gives you perspective on anything you want to do, whether it's uh, meditation or yoga or tai chi or any or or uh, mahasi, uh, sayadaw type meditations or goenkaji or any of these these different teachers or different methods or even different, you know, like uh, the training training the physical body with these various mindful practices, yoga and Tai Chi, things like that, Qigong can, you know, really are, uh, you know, fit well into it's an intuitive approach, actually, ultimately, if we, if we're, when we develop those techniques, it ends up as, it has to trust in the mindfulness rather than in just me my willful efforts trying to do all these things. Remember when I started yoga years ago, Hatha Yoga, just see these pictures of yogis doing all these fantastic postures. I wanted to do them. The really, you know, the really impressive ones because I had a big ego and wanted to, you know, want to be the boring kind of things that you start out with. But, you know, really aiming at the at the fantastic. Of course, you've kind of uh, damaged yourself <laughs> trying to make your body do what what you want before it's ready to. It's pretty dangerous. <laughs> so intuition is is also knowing the limits of of your own body, what it can take. And it's not just willfully making it do this and do that according to your ideals or ideas of what you want want it to do. Because you can really, as many of you know, damage your body quite badly through just a kind of tyrannical forcing it to do something. So it's... Uh, Learning, you know, mindfulness includes the body. Sati Sampachanya. So it's willing to, and includes its limitation. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, disabilities. It's sicknesses. As, as well as its health and its, uh, pleasures. another thing is pleasure because we can think of uh, in Theravada Buddhism where physical, sensual pleasure is, we, we can easily see it in terms of something we shouldn't enjoy and being celibate and almost mendicant then there's this, uh, the, we, the Western mind especially uh, easily sees it in terms of denying pleasure, happiness and joy, like I say, all is suffering. We do the asupa practices, we say the body is foul, loathsome, filled with excrement, pus and slime and things like that. And, and so then we, so you shouldn't even, you know, look at for your monk, you should never look at a woman and keep your eyes down, and you shouldn't indulge in the pleasures of beauty and many things. So I remember even in Thailand, I was getting you shouldn't even look at a flower. 
because it, its beauty would capture me and and um, and make me uh, think of worldly thoughts, you know. It's mine from a from a kind of um, background, Christian background that has a, a strong kind of puritanical ethic to it. So it's easy for someone like me from a culture like mine to assume that that pleasure, uh, sense pleasure is bad and you you know, it's dangerous. You've got to try to, uh, deny it and, uh, avoid it at all costs. But then that's another opinion and view that comes out of the analytical mind, isn't it? That's, uh, the, that's, you know, from, from my cultural background, the logic is seen, the foulness or the loathsomeness of the body, a super practice, it's easy for me to, to see it in terms of being repelled and, and, uh, seeing the body in terms of something absolutely disgusting and, and it's easy to say, I can convince myself of this bodily functions and also, you know, to see, you know, you sometimes you even look at yourself even when you're fairly healthy and you feel disgusted. At least I can. <laughs> so that uh, it's, it's not a, you know, it's a kind of natural uh, way to, to feel about yourself if you're identified with the body and you and you dwell on its uh, less appealing aspects but in the word asupa is is not it, this you know it's loathsome is this isn't a very good word because to me loathsome means is really just really repelled and averse. If something's loathsome, it's dirty and foul, and and you just have develop aversion. You just want to get rid of it. It's bad and nasty. So, but asupa doesn't have that. It means the non-beautiful. Supa is beautiful. Asupa is non-beautiful. So that's that that puts it in a better context you know, of looking at what is not beautiful and noticing it. Because we don't, you know, we, we don't notice. We tend to give our attention to the beautiful, say, in the worldly life. And then the non-beautiful we either ignore or we reject. We, or we don't pay any attention to it. We don't, we just dismiss it if it's just not very attractive or non-beautiful. So the, the vowel a uh, a uh, in asupa is a negation, like amaravati, the deathless. Mara is death. Amara is deathless. I found that a, a better way of looking at a super practice, and not looking at the. Remember, in the old days, Kanti Paolo Bhikkhu in not not uh, the German one, but the English one that is robed. He, he used to he wrote this book called Bag of Bones, and published in Buddhist Buddhist Society publication. It's the most disgusting book I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just so foul. And then uh, you know, and he he seemed to enjoy it. like you know, when you talk to him, you see the eye dirt and the, and the ear dirt and he got kind of glee almost you know he got kind of perverted kind of joy out of contemplating the foul excretions of one's body and, and it almost a creepy feeling you know this, this, I don't think this is a super it's more like pornography <laughs> Uh, 
like any of you that have uh, have have uh, seen autopsies, then that uh, you know it's. I find these, uh, you know, not leading to, to like a, a depression or aversion. You know, contemplating a, a dead human body and and when they're cutting it up in an autopsy. You know, at first it's shocking. You feel shocked because it's, you know, something that you, if you've never seen it, it can be pretty shocking. And and the uh, smells and the and the appearance can be, you can feel averse to it at first. But if you stay beyond that, if you, if you, if you can, you know, stay beyond just the initial reaction of shock or aversion, and, and, and with a sati sampachanya, kind of open to the, to it, uh, to the, to this, then it, what I find is, uh, is this sense of dispassion, which is a very is a cool feeling. It's very clear, very cool, very pleasant to be dispassionate. It's not like a dispassion through dullness or just through kind of, you know, a kind of cynicism, uh, uh, an intellectual cynicism. It's a feeling of just of of uh, just a, f- a feeling of. Of non-aversion, but not not no longer seeing the human body in the in such the, the standard way of either, you know, being seeing it only as very attractive and beautiful, or seeing it as ugly and and foul. But being able to just relate to this this human body, the body that we call our own or somebody else's, or a corpse. Just is seeing it in terms of 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 sati panya, sati sampachanya is the, the experience of dispassion. Well, I say lust is uh, is a lack of discrimination, isn't it? It's the 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 uh, experience of like lust, sexual lust, is is a, a strong passion that takes you over, and you lose your discriminative abilities. The more you absorb into it, the more less discriminatory you get. <clears throat> Where, where the critical mind, like uh, the, can, uh, and it's interesting, the critical people, tend, the people that are kind of dosa jarit types, they like the super practices usually. They like, uh, or they like very methodic meditations. You know, you do this and then you do that, and then kind of very, you know, intellectually well presented stage one stage two nicely ni- in a nice little outline and then uh, to see the body as as foul and disgusting is 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 very if you're critical it's easy to to um, see it that way or say uh, uh Raga jarit, a kind of gama raga, lustful, greedy type person. They like metta meditation the best. They teach metta and they, oh, you know. <laughs> because metta, you're not, not critical, is it? Metta is you're, you're, you're not being critical about anything. So these are upayas to to, uh, to to get perspective. If one is a uh, 
you know, a lustful type, then uh, the super practices are very can be very balancing, can be very skillfully used for developing a more discriminative, more aware of the unpleasantness or the 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 non-beautiful, and then the dosajarit, the the averse types, the metta, being able to to accept what you don't like without in, indulging in in being critical and and rejecting and averse to it. So metta meditation then is really it's uh, willing it's, it's like it, it it's uh, you know it can be done in a kind of tech you know stylized way that we have but basically it is sati sampachanya sati sampachanya is not it's not uh, you know it accepts it includes metta is one of those inclusive is very intuitive rather than conceptual. So we're not, we're not, when you try to conceive metta as love, a kind of liking or, you know, loving something in a term of liking it, it, it makes it impossible, you know, to, to sustain metta when you get to things you can't stand or people you hate and things like that. It's, you just can't. You know, it's really hard to and to to come to terms with it on a conceptual level, isn't it? Like, love your enemies, or to love people you hate, who you can't stand, is on the conceptual level is an impossible dilemma. But in terms of sati sampatanya, it's not, it's you know it's it's accepting it's. It's because it includes everything you hate, and like and dislike. So then, metta is is isn't analytical. It's not it's not dwelling on why why you hate somebody. And it's not uh, not trying to figure out why I hate this person. But it includes the whole thing, why the, the the feeling, the person, myself, all in the same moment. So it's uh, embracing the point that includes non-critical. You aren't you aren't trying to figure out anything, but just open and accept, patient with being patient. So with food, for instance, it's, you know, is it, we can, we can see that because we eat of the Tudanga tradition, they are eating from alms bowls and uh, uh, this uh, I never can convince myself I'm eating one meal a day anymore <laughs> but, uh, because of this breakfast <laughs> but uh, whatever how many meals a day you eat it's uh it's uh, the, the idea is to is 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 limitation, not because of, there's anything wrong with I- enjoying a meal. It's not like like food is dangerous and you've got to you know any kind of pleasure you you receive from eating is uh, is uh, will bind you to rebirth again in the samsara vata. That's another view and opinion, but recognize that it's the the Simplicity of of the life that we have. It's it's simplifying everything. This is this this is why I like this way.
then the pleasure in its notice, the attitude towards food, about how you, you know, just the, 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 the greed or the aversion or the guilt about eating or enjoying food, good food or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, include it all, you know, both. It's not, there's no attitude that you have to have, you know, that you, Toward it, but an attitude of of sati sampatanya. So not making eating into any hassle. You know, like Lung Pacha with when I go on these fasts and all that, he He'd say, you know, and he'd point out, I was always making a hassle out of my food. You know, I, ju- I couldn't just eat. I had to, there was always, I was making, making it more difficult than it need be. And then the guilt that comes up if you, you know, if you eat too much or you find yourself, you know, you find yourself trying to get the good bits to bring up this kind of uh, in me I remember you know trying to you know get the good pieces for myself and then feeling guilty about that so you know there's a there's a greed that that really you know wants to wants the good the the tasty bits and then feels guilty about it it gets complicated I couldn't be just greedy and shameless. I also <laughs> had to deal with a strong sense of guilt around it, and not wanting people to, hoping nobody'd notice. If I did, if I was being greedy, I was hoping nobody would uh, see. <laughs> I keep it a secret because I didn't want to look greedy. I wanted to look like I wasn't greedy. So I remember with Lung Po Jan, and I was trying to be a vegetarian then, really strict. Lung Po Jan and, and Wat Bung Kaluang, seventh Vasa, and he uh, he let me do this. So I, I was helping pass out the food too. And so at the, the monastery, they had certain kinds of. Uh, dishes that didn't have any fish sauce in them or any kind of meat or fish. But as most of you know in Thailand, most of the food has fish sauce in it or some kind of kind of uh, animal mixtures into it. So it's really uh, hard. It was difficult because uh, I could, had very little choice and then people would always have to make special things for me. I would have to be special. And to be Ajahn Sumato's, or it was not Ajahn then, but Pat Sumato's food, and then the rest. So that was hard to deal with, you know, to be, to, oh, you know, to be a foreigner, a prapfrang, and then have special diet and special privileges, and, and that. And I, that didn't. That was hard to for me to uh, impose. On, on the group. But then the passing out the food, I get very possessive, like the vegetable dishes they did have. I felt I had a right to have a lot of it. Because the other monks were eating all the fish and chicken and things like that. So I find myself, when I was passing out, aiming for the vegetarian dishes first, so I could pass them out according to, <laughs> to my own needs. And I was really brought up a really kind of uh, uh, childish tendency in me. And then one time, one monk, he, uh, he saw me doing this. So he, he grabbed the vegetarian dish first and only gave me a little spoonful of <laughs> So 
then I was so angry when I saw that I took this this uh, fermented fish sauce, this plodak, kind of this very kind of strong stuff. And uh, when I went by his bowl, I splattered it all over his food. Fortunately, we are forbidden to hit each other. This is, <laughs> this is, an, ab- uh, this is an absolute necessity for men to have rules of n- n- non-physical violence. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, trying to live up to an ideal of vegetarian purity, and yet in the process, you know, <laughs> having these really violent feelings in, uh, towards other monks, you know, what's this about? You know, wanting to, you know, this is a vindictive act, wasn't it? A violent act to, to splatter all that strong chili sauce with a, with a rotten fish in it over some monks food was a violent act in order to keep me in the sense of I'm you know I'm a pure vegetarian and so I could I began to question whether I wanted to to make food into such a big deal for my life you know really was I wanting to live my life as a vegetarian or what was that the main focus that I was aiming at so then, then just contemplating this, I, I, you know, I just began to see the the suffering I created around my idealism. So it's then in in terms of you know I noticed like Lung Po Cha certainly enjoyed his food and and he, he had a joyful presence and so it was wasn't like you know uh, an ascetic trip where you you know eating nettle soup and and uh, and and rejecting the the good bits that's the other extreme. So sati sampachanya, then it, it, it's uh, you know it's it's uh, it includes, and that's that's what we that's the the kind of attitude of a of a samana rather than the ascetic, which is uh, yusha, you know, uh, sensual temptations, the sensual world, sensual pleasures are are bad and dangerous and you've got to fight against them and resist them at all costs in order to become pure because your purity is once you get rid of sexual desire greed for food uh, all these other uh, kind of greedy unpleasant uh, sense things you know coarse gross things and you, you don't have any more bad thoughts and you don't have any more anger greed, hatred, and delusion in your mind, you're absolutely sterilized from any of those things. And like like eradicated totally, wiped out like these toilet cleansers that you pour down that kill every germ in sight, then you're pure. <clears throat> and then, you know, you, you manage to kill everything, <clears throat> including yourself. <laughs> So is that is that what is that the aim? You know, that's the, that's taking asceticism to the attakila matanu yoke position of annihilation, or the gamma sukalikanu yoka one, where you just you know pleasure, live, live, uh, drink, eat, and be merry, or tomorrow you may die. You know this. Enjoy life. 
Uh, life is here for, life is a banquet. And most of the suckers are starving to death. The movie back in the 50s. The, the Auntie May was called her. Life is a banquet, and all the suckers are starving to death. And so Auntie May managed to, you know, really enjoy the hilt in the movie anyway. So she's a kind of icon, a kind of, you know, not a real woman, but a, an icon of, of just, uh, you know, intelligent beauty and one who just lived life to the hilt and, and enjoyed everything. So that's a very attractive idol, isn't it? To, to uh, see this, this life is meant to be full of pleasure and happiness and love. So that grasping that, you know, is the Gama Sukhali Kanu Yoka. Then in the Samana is, is awakening to these. It includes both. Not like taking sides. It's not that Auntie Mame and the, and life is a banquet is we're rejecting that. Or think you know condemning it, or the or the extreme ascetic, the life denying annihilator. But we can see that these are conditions that we create in our minds. You know, like like wanting always life to be at its best. You know, just a party, a banquet, one pleasure after another. Just uh, assuming that is is where where it's at. Or thinking that life is, that if you have any pleasure or enjoyment in it, it's wrong and bad and lesser and dangerous. Those are conditions we create. But the summoner, life is like this right now, it's like this. So it's an opening to what we tend to not notice when we're seeking those two extremes as our as our goal. So life is like this. It's it's kind of say it's a it's a banquet all the time, is it? Breath going in. Wouldn't really describe it as a banquet or the sound of silence is, you know, life at its best, where it's just one laugh after another. (laughs) Just like this. I mean, most of our experience is neither one extreme or the other. It's like this, and the most of your one life that you live is is not the peak moments, either in their height or their depth, but it's neither nor with the that which we don't notice if we're primed for the extremities. I find in in terms of like beauty, for example, the 
coming from Sati Sampachanya, rather than from personal attachment. And so like beautiful objects, beautiful things, beautiful people, or whatever, then coming from personal habit, it is dangerous. Because of the, of the desire to possess them, isn't it? To, to have them for yourself, or be attracted, and, and get kind of overwhelmed by the desires that arise through seeing beauty through ignorance. And then beauty from the sati sampatanya, then one then you can be aware of that, of the, you know, of the beauty as beauty. And then he, and you also include one's own tendencies to want to own it or take it or touch it or or fear it. You know, it, it includes that. But in when you're letting go of that, then Beauty itself is is joy. We live on a planet that is quite beautiful. You know, nature in a wise is quite beautiful to the eye. So it, seen from the Sati Sampatanya, then I experience joy from that. So seen from the personal habits, then it can get complicated. Like a, a complicated, no doubt, with <laughs> wanting, not wanting, guilt, and or just not even noticing. You know, if you get too involved with your own, what's in your head, you don't even notice after a while anything outside. You can be in the most beautiful place in the world and not see it not notice it. So then beauty, say, as experience or sense, sense pleasure then is seen as, as something for what it is. It, it is pleasurable. Good food does taste good. Tasting good, delicious flavor is like this. It's thoroughly enjoyable. You know, it's, it's, it's that's the way it is. <laughs> and then you come to, oh, I shouldn't. Uh, then you're adding more to it. But from Sadi Sampatanya, then it is what it is. So things become really, and it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's experience then the flow of life from this center point, from the still point that includes, rather than from the, you know, the, the, the point that excludes, the extremity, where we want only the beautiful and the good and the good taste and the life is a banquet and just have one banquet after another uh, that's an extremity that when we can't sustain that illusion we get depressed we go to the opposite wanting to kill ourselves or annihilate ourselves in some way
So it's like like this weather we've been having is a, it's a, you know, it's, just, it's the kind of uh, what people think England is all the time: cold, wet, damp, drizzly, grey. <laughs> so this is the this is the percep- worldwide perception of England. So then, uh, so then I decided I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to, yeah, you know, I decided to open a satisampatanya to this, these conditions. So it is what it is, you know, but it, it, I'm not creating a version onto it. You know, it's, it's all right. Nothing, and it isn't like this very often. I've lived in this country 24 years. Uh, some of the most beautiful weather I've ever experienced has been here in this country. The perfect days of the so beautiful and the greenness and the beautiful flowers and hills and things like this. So, you know, it's uh, but th- those can be easily dismissed. And remembering the, the 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 perception of the, that England is like this is as a constant factor. So the the city of China includes uh, you know the cold wet gray, drizzly weather. And then it doesn't, it doesn't, there's no aversion created in it. In fact, I find, I like, like it in a way because I don't feel compelled to go out in it. I can sit in my kuti and kind of keep warm. I quite enjoy feeling I don't have to go out anywhere and just, you know, because the weather's so good, I can just stay in my room. I mean, I quite like, you know, quite nice feeling. To, to not, when the weather gets really good, I always feel I should be out. Get this guy. <laughs> Desire to go out in, into it. I mean, these are just ways of, of uh, just noticing, you know, even within the, what is, uh, can be, Physically unpleasant, like cold uh, dampness and that, and things like this that we find maybe unpleasant as a, as sensory experiences. But can we? But we. The suffering really is from the aversion. You know, I don't like this. I don't want life to be like this. Want to be where there's blue skies and sunshine all the time. So, like, like neutrality, that they can, uh, say, sweeping, body sweeping practice. You know, this paying attention to neutral sensation I found very helpful to me because it was so easily ignored. You know, it completely ignored. Uh, when I first started doing it years ago, 
because I never paid attention to neutral sensation, I found it difficult to find, even though it's quite obvious. Because my experience of sensation was always through extremity, as either pleasure or pain. But then noticing just the how the the robe touches the skin, I mean, or the or just the one hand touching the other, or the tongue in the mouth, the tongue the tongue touching the palate or the teeth, or the upper lip resting on the lower lip, or investigating little details of of sensation that are there when you open to them, isn't it? They're there, but you don't notice them, you know, unless you determine it. Because if they're, if your lips are painful, you notice. If they're feeling, if you're getting a lot of pleasure from your lips, then you don't. <laughs> but when there's neither pleasure nor pain, there's still sensation in there. It's neutral. And so you're, you're allowing neutrality to be conscious. You see, this is like consciousness is a mirror where it reflects. So a mirror reflects. It doesn't reflect just the beautiful or the ugly. It'll, you really look into the mirror. It's reflecting whatever, the space, the, the neutral, everything that, that is in front of it. But if you, if you, you know, you can only notice the, the, the outstanding ones, either the really, you know, the extremities of beauty or ugliness. But to be awakened, to awaken to the way it is, then you're, you're not looking at the obvious, but recognizing the subtlety behind the beauty and the ugliness, the extremities. So like with sound of silence, isn't it? it's like a subtlety behind everything that you awaken to because you don't notice it usually if you're seeking the extremities. When you're seeking happiness and trying to get away from pain and misery, when you're caught in that, always trying to get something or hold on to happiness, if you or tranquility, is it? We want tranquility. We want samatha and jhanas and get tranquil. Uh, and so that because we like, we like tranquility. And then we don't want confusion or chaos or cacophony or, or, uh, abrasive sensory experiences or human contacts. We don't want that. So we, you know, we we sit, close our eyes, don't bother me, give off the signs, you know, coming to the temple and sit down, don't bother me attitude and uh, leave me alone and uh, I'm going to get my meditation, my samadhi. So then that is, that can be the, the very basis for our practice, getting my samadhi. So I... I can be, I can feel good, because I want that. So that leads to an extremity again, of wanting, you know, trying to always be after the ideal of some something, of refined conscious experience. <clears throat> then there's the others that they, oh, you don't need to do that, you just Daily life is good enough. Just in the marketplace practice, that's where it's really at. Where you're not doing anything extreme like sitting, closing your eyes, but you're just, you know, living life as an ordinary person and, and, uh, and being mindful of everything. And, uh, that sounds, that also can be another ideal that we attach to the, these are ideals, aren't they? Positions that we might take.
So they, they, they're kind of true but not right, right but not true predicament that we make with our dualistic mind. Not that they're wrong, either one. You know, that one's wrong and one's right. Or one's more right than the other. Animal farm. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> yeah. You can't help. In the conditioned realm, it, just think like that, isn't it? In terms of, we all think we're, uh, human beings are all equal, don't we? Ideally, all human beings are equal. But then in the practicalities of life, some are more equal than others. <laughs> you know, if I find the affluent Western world willing to give up very much for the sake of equality in the third world, do they? I mean, they really resist. The immigrants are not coming into the country. <laughs> they might lower the standard of living. We'd be more equal then. <laughs> So reflect on it like monastic form is a it's a convention, and so it has it has you know its aim is to it's connected to the world, and so it's through its uh, alms mendicancy we need the society, we need the world around we need the lay community for our survival. They're a part, you know, we're not, we're not, a, it's not an attack or a rejection of lay life. And so that need then, and, and then our, then our life does, you know, if we're, if we're living in a, you know, in a, trying to live in, in the right way, then the lay community, uh, brings out their good qualities, generosity and gratitude, things like this. So then, um, but we also can we the move towards silence is encouraged, towards meditation, reflection, so we, we can, we combine both the kind of samatha, vipassana, the, the, uh, the, the life of solitude with the worldly life. You know, it's not, not to be, you know, to, to, re, to reject one and, and hold on to the other as the ideal, but to recognize this is the way it is. Like this, the the world that we live in, the society that we live in, we're 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 not we're not rejecting it or turning against it or away from it, but including it. And so then we can include in the the, the silence and the and the uh, solitude. So viveka then is a like. Gaya Viveka, Jiti Viveka, Ubati Viveka, there's three kind of Vivekas. Uh, Gaya Viveka is like physical solitude. Jitta Viveka is mental. Ubati Viveka is, is intuitive.
So tomorrow is the uh, is the last day before the one pro- the observance. So the, there'll be monks, Ajahn Menindo, and the hundred monks are coming today, and then we'll have an influx. Twenty fourth, the bhikkhus will have their Samaki Patimoka, which is a so new poster today, but also the monks from from uh, Chithurst and uh, Switzerland, Italy, Arnhem, all will uh, have a Samaki Patimoka is is the is the ideal of of, of unity. It's a it's a it's a way of of uh, reaffirming this sense of samaki, of being together, working together. Because the sangha, that in the bhikkhu sangha, has been quite divided in the past few years. Sense of samaki has not been a, a common uh, perception of the bhikkhu life in this country. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's. Uh, it's quite important uh, event for the for, for the bhikkhus because uh, it's a uh, it's also uh, you know it's, it it's a tradition but it also it allows this sense of of samaki uh, within in the Pali word which means unity united. Harmonious, working together rather than dividing, separating. Then the, the sisters from Chittist will come up. It will be Samarki for the Silindaras. But they're already fairly Samarki already, so... <laughs> <laughs> 